everybody. Welcome to our uh, seminar series today on monitoring and evaluating your COVID-19 response. I'm going to wait one more minute while a couple more people join. I can see the numbers still going up um, on our webinar today. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker. Um, welcome to the COVID-19 seminar series um, led by the Hopkins Center for Global Health. Again, the purpose of the series is to try and support our partners and LMIC institutions who are now facing the front lines of the COVID pandemic themselves and bring some of the resources, the evidence-based practices um, and lessons learned from our faculty here at Hopkins um, to help those worldwide. Um, this week we have monitoring and evaluating the COVID-19 response and then on Thursday we have Chris Breyers talking to us about COVID-19 impact on vulnerable populations such as refugees and so I hope you can tune into that today. But without further ado we have Dr. Shruti Mehta who's a professor and deputy chair in the Department of Epidemiology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health she is also the co-lead for the Johns Hopkins Working Group on the COVID-19 Community Response. We'll have about 15 to 20 minutes of um, a, a lecture that she's prepared. And then please use the Q&A function that you can see on your screens um, to send me questions. And then the chat function is there just for general hellos if you fancy them. Um, Shruti, I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bhakti and, and Megan, for inviting me um, to talk today about monitoring and evaluation. Um, so I'm going to talk today very briefly about the kinds of data uh, that are important to, to monitoring what's happening with this pandemic. And I, I kind of wanted to start with the, with the data that we have. Um, so, you know, in this pandemic, there has been a lot of emphasis on modeling. As an epidemiologist, I have to say that it feels like epidemiology has almost become synonymous with, with disease modeling. And from the beginning, there has been drastic variability in what these models have predicted, even for a single setting. Um, most of you should be familiar with these two models. Um, these were early models that came out for the United States, um, ranging, you know, and, and show very different predictions. There was the IHME model, which predicted at the low end, fewer than 60,000 deaths across the, the course of the pandemic. Of course, they, they revised those estimates. And then there was the Imperial College modeling that predicted more than 2 million at the high end estimate. Of course, it was this model that, um, that nearly led to a lot of the shutdowns and, and preventive strategies put in place. But this isn't just for the US. You can find a model for pretty much any country that you look for at this point. Um, and I don't want to discount the importance of these models. They've been critical for making decisions, again, about lockdown, social distancing, other preventive strategies. But what I want to emphasize today is that that these aren't enough, right? Models alone aren't gonna be enough to get the answers that we need. Um, so all of these models require a number of inputs uh, and the models are only as good as the quality of these inputs that go into them, right? So in order to parameterize these models, we need accurate real-time data collection to monitor trends and cases, outcomes, measure the impact of interventions and help us guide the response. I think the other challenge with COVID-19, as we know, is that things are developing so rapidly and changing almost daily, right? The models result in changes in policies, which in turn affects these parameters, which then, which populate the models, right? So it's kind of a vicious circle and it's very difficult to keep up. So then what do we do? So, you know, I, I will say that in addition to the models, it's not, you know, we have these models, but it's not all we have in terms of data monitoring. And there are really a number of fantastic resources that have been stood up relatively quickly. Um, and I've just listed a few of them here and, and provided the links. Many of these you probably all are already familiar with and perhaps like me, check every day. Um, so for example, the, um, the Hopkins COVID tracker, which is one of the earliest ones out there, is a great resource for just kind of that, you know, 5,000 foot view that tracks cases and deaths and every single country, it's updated in real time, and can give you a snapshot of what's happening in a particular moment in time. 
Another one that I really like um, is this uh, COVID, you know, is this uh, Our World in Data. Um, and I've just picked a couple of, of graphs from here, um, but there are a number of different um, presentations of data and you can actually download the data itself that populates these figures. But here you get a sense, not just of a, a snapshot in time, but what's happening actually over time in terms of trends. Um, so the data are presented by country and a number of different stratifications. And so you can contrast what's happening in a particular country with another Another one. Um, that's the level of granularity, though, that we see here just by country. Um, again, great resources. I think just to remember um, about a lot, one thing to remember about a lot of these resources is that they're just numerators. Um, and so there are a lot of things that influence these numerators, these absolute numbers. And so you can make comparisons across countries, across settings, but you have to remember what underlies these numbers. And in particular, when we look at case reports, we have to think about the major thing that underlies those estimates, which is testing. Um, so how much testing you're doing is going to directly impact your case count data. And we know that there's been dramatic variability um, across countries, across settings with access to testing, whether you're testing everyone, testing symptomatics, um, testing different groups of people, and that can dramatically impact how you interpret these numbers. So just something to keep in mind. So a lot of great resources, but I think as we use these resources and try to, to, to understand from them what's happening with the epidemic in a particular setting, it's good to understand the limitations. Um, a lot of the, one of the great things about these data sources and particularly the real-time trackers is that because they're using existing sources and aggregating these data, um, they're, they're based on you know, existing reporting mechanisms. So they can be updated in real time, but there are also challenges with using those, um, those kind of standard data sources, right? You have to, and again, it's just that constantly thinking about how reliable is the data that underlies those sources. So thinking about, again, as I said, how many people are being tested? How does that influence your assessment of the trend? That there's been a lot of conversation about death. Are we really capturing all of the deaths? How are we capturing deaths? Are we actually, do we actually know the COVID-19 status of, of all of the deaths that we're counting? Who are we missing? Um, and then, you know, I think these numbers, these absolute numbers of these broad outcomes tell you the what, but perhaps not the how or the why. And again, to get at some of that, we need a little bit more information. So that's what I wanted to talk a little bit about. So moving into the kind of what do we need? Um, so again, as an epidemiologist, I always like to start with the ideal, right? If we could have everything we wanted, um, what would we do? If we had all the resources, if we had the person power to actually do it, what would we do to get the best sense of what was happening with the epidemic in our setting? Um, so if you think about a particular health center, ideally you would test everyone that came into that health center, right? Regardless of symptoms, regardless of why they presented, you would just offer everyone a test. Um, and this would give you a better estimate of how much infection there is, right? Because you'd be testing people regardless of their symptoms. And then you would monitor those individuals who tested positive for outcomes. You would look to see who gets hospitalized. You would look to look, you would look to see mortality prospectively for those who get hospitalized, what's the time to discharge. And you would importantly collect data on comorbidities. So you would have some assessment of how these comorbidities influence each of the outcomes. And an even better world, you would actually be able to follow individuals into the community post when they were discharged from the hospital. There's been a lot of conversation about um, kind of the long-term impacts, neurologic, cardiac, things that are happening after weeks after people are infected. And so having a mechanism to follow people. So this is one thing you could do in an even better world we recognize, you know, because we recognize that even this sample is biased, right? Even testing people who present to a health center, you're relying on people that come to you for some reason, for some indication. So that's still not giving you a picture of what's happening in the population. So an even more ideal approach would be to take a true community-based sample, right? So to sample, there are many ways to do this, but take a sample of households, much like we do with the DHS surveys or other things like that, to determine the true burden or the prevalence of infection in the population. You could follow that same sample to, to monitor incidents, so measure new cases in the community, and then follow cases again to outcomes to understand the broader range of outcomes in a population with a spectrum of disease severity rather than just the most severe cases that present to a hospital. So of course both of these things take time, they take resources, um, 
they take a huge effort. There are some things that you could do to streamline. So for example, the testing in the hospital, you don't need to necessarily test everyone for years and, you know, for months and months, you could take a week and just test everyone um, at that over a week and then take a break and then do some testing at a subsequent time. So there are ways to streamline some of this. Um, but what are the alternatives? Uh, that we can think about when we don't have the resources. I just like to present the ideal scenario because I think it's important to think in the back of our minds, what is, what is the optimal way to do this? Um, what do we have resources to do? And then how do we interpret the data from, from what we do recognizing that we're not necessarily collecting data in the most optimal way? So really this is kind of just, you know, bread and butter monitoring evaluation and really trying to think about how you can integrate into routine systems and at least record what's being done and maybe supplement a bit. And I think there are three key areas that you wanna think about capturing information in. So the first of course is transmission and case detection. What we've seen a lot of is just, again, these case counts, um, you know, per, per setting, per country. And I've already emphasized, you know, trying to take this a step further to incorporate testing coverage, not just how many tests, but who's being tested to be able to calculate rates and rates per different types of populations. The second domain is, of course, in, in terms of clinical consequences, capturing things like outcomes, but also changing symptom profiles. This is something we've also seen evolve over time and has implications for how we target testing with this changing, changing symptom profile. Um, and then one of the things that I feel really strongly about is that you know, we, we focus so much on disease and people who are infected, and obviously that's the, that's the priority, but we know that for for populations at large, the impacts go far beyond just the disease to social economic well-being and also to other health outcomes, the consequences of delaying care or not receiving care for other health conditions because of COVID. And so integrating ways to monitor that as well. Um, I'm gonna talk about some potential, some recommended you know, indicators, but in thinking about those, again, some things to keep in mind as, as you think about all of these, these sources of these ways of collecting data, denominators, 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 I know I've said that, um, risk stratification. We've seen a lot of overall estimates, you know, the number of cases or the proportion that die, but, but it's really important to stratify by um, multiple characteristics and not just by one characteristic by age, but also by cross age with gender, with race, with other factors to truly understand how different groups are being affected. Um, it's important to understand the definitions that underlie each of your indicators. And then, you know, thinking through the logistics of what really is possible. Again, I presented the ideal scenario, but what can you do to collect enough data to, to, to get what you need, but not necessarily overwhelm the system? So I'm not gonna go through this in detail because, I, because I, I'm assuming these slides will be posted, but just to, you know, these are just kind of thinking through some of the things that we've been thinking about here, learning from our experience with m and for, for HIV and other activities, what are the key indicators um, that might be recommended and the stratifications for those indicators. And again, I've divided them into those domains that I mentioned earlier, so transmission, clinical consequences, and then total burden, right? And so again, for transmission, I've, I've talked about this, not just the number of tests and the number of people, not just the number of people who test positive, but the number of tests and actually calculating a proportion. And then monitoring that by the indication for the test, was someone asymptomatic or symptomatic? Were they a contact, contact of someone else? Um, and then general age, gender, comorbidities. Um, and then, you know, for the clinical consequences, again, monitoring hospitalizations, adverse outcomes, deaths, and again, not just the individual counts, but where possible, the proportions. Again, with that, that same recommended stratification. And then finally, some assessment that you can get from, I see a typo there, of total burden is to monitor also, you know, other health outcomes and COVID, non-COVID related mortality in a given health setting, trying to monitor the proportion of outcomes or adverse outcomes or deaths that are attributable to COVID versus non-COVID. Challenging to actually be able to, to attribute something to COVID or not, but at least to monitor in a consistent way to assess how the pandemic is affecting other health outcomes. So again, I emphasized a couple of things and I just wanted to show why, show some data for why I emphasize those things. So in particular stratification, um, right? So if you have a single estimate of case fatality rate or of the proportion tested, 
you, applying that to the entire population is challenging because it may mask key differences between subgroups. And a place that we've really seen this is with respect to age, right? These are data that you probably are all familiar with. They came out of China early on um, in the pandemic and they show the case fatality rates and the real difference um, that we've seen by age, right? And this is consistently seen across other settings and has implications for how you direct treatment or prevention strategies to different groups. I think it's important to monitor these things over time because you also want to be able to detect new trends, you know, some of the very disturbing trends that we're starting to see among very young children. And you'll only see those if you're able to stratify um, by age or other, other characteristics. The other piece is denominators. Um, we miss so much when we only look at an absolute case count. And so I wanted to show two examples of why this is so important. This is a, um, a figure from a paper that was uh, published on uh, prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 infection in Iceland. And so they used a couple of different strategies to recruit people and to, to estimate prevalence of infection. The first was a targeted testing approach where they essentially tested people who had an indication for testing, that's the first column D, um, where they were symptomatic or were a suspected case. And then the second column is individuals that were selected for population screening, so a more population-based approach. And what I want to draw your attention to is that these two axes are completely different. The targeted testing axis goes to 25 percent um, and the population screening axis goes to 2.5 percent. So the, though these um, numbers, these proportions look the same, they are very different. And you can see that you get vastly different inferences when you first stratify by age, stratify by gender, but also when you have a different denominator. Um, so your inference is going to be very different depending on your denominator. The other place where we see this is with the case fatality rate. So most of what we've seen um, published and, and discussed is case fatality rate, the number of deaths divided by the number of confirmed cases. What we really care about um, as epidemiologists is the number of deaths divided by the number of actual cases. Now this is challenging to come by because we don't have broad testing and so we don't actually often know the, actu the underlying burden, but you can see from this figure, from this paper that also includes data from China, how different your inference would be with a different denominator. So again, just pointing out that when you do collect data, um, potentially with a little bit of extra effort, if you can collect information to actually calculate a proportion to do the stratifications that are appropriate, uh, it'll improve your inferences um, and also your response. The other question, of course, is how frequently does data need to be collected? Um, the answer is daily, you know, if you really can do it. Ideally, if you can set up a system to, to be monitoring every day what's happening, I think, again, you know, things are changing so rapidly that, that you want to be able to collect as much information as you can and report in real time. If not, then, then weekly as possible. Ideally, you do this with simple electronic systems that are just Excel-based, nothing fancy, um, and try to integrate with required reporting. And, you know, I just pulled a couple of places that are a lot of a lot of cities in the US and states are, are using dashboards, right, taking daily data and just putting it online so that people can can see what's happening in a particular state, a particular city, but there's no reason you couldn't do this for a particular center as well. I think the other thing I would say is I think it, you know, it helps the individuals working on the response to be able to see data in real time. So having this data available to people, um, I think even can help with response and, and motivate people that are working. The other thing I mentioned was the, the, the last thing I wanted to close with is the, the broader impacts. You know, so a lot of what I've talked about is just using data that's available to measure cases, to measure outcomes, to measure deaths. But there is this other component of those social economic impacts. And this is a whole other layer of data collection that requires actually asking people questions, but there have been a number of resources put out there to capture quick information on mental health and impacts, on impacts on employment, um, on people's socialization and how that impacts their, and their health and then impact on other health outcomes. The NIH has actually put together a repository of tools, essentially any investigator um, that puts together a set of tools for their study or their setting is uh, welcome to submit to this site and then they're collating and making these tools available. The idea is for people to really share resources. Um, and I just wanted to mention that we, our group here, our community response group actually put together a set of tools um, for this purpose meant to be broadly shared and used. We, you 
you know, we started with a focus on the US, but many of us work in international settings. So we had an eye towards that as well. And the idea here is just some standardized measures that you can pick and choose from to measure some of these other uh, impacts within your population. So this is a resource that's available. So just in closing, I think, you know, the, the first way to start in terms, of, in terms of collecting data and monitoring and evaluating your epidemic is to leverage what's already there. Um, that's going to be the fastest approach, but potentially there's a role for supplementing with some additional information to provide risk stratification and denominator. So if I've convinced you of, of anything today, hopefully those two pieces of how important those are. Uh, I think it's always important to understand the limitations of the data. You know, we have to do what we have to do. Perfect can't be the enemy of good here. We have to do things rapidly. We need data to respond. But it's just important to recognize the underlying limitations of the data, the definitions of the indicators that you make and interpret them accordingly. And then, you know, things are changing all the time. And so monitoring these changes in measurement, particularly I've talked so much about testing, right? So if you're looking at trends in cases to really understand how the changes in the measurement impact your inferences so that you can interpret accordingly. Thank you, Shruti. That was a whirlwind. Oh my God, so much knowledge. Um, we have a lot of questions, which is great. Um, I'm going to start off with two forecast. I want you to look in a crystal ball and answer two forecasting questions, and then we have some specific um, indicator questions. So the first forecasting question is, um, in all the graphs that you've shown, we see an exponential increase in the number of cases based on the models done to date. When should we expect a decrease in numbers? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Didn't I say I'm not a modeler? <laughs> I know you did. I'm going to defer that. Quite. You know, I think we just don't know. I yeah. think that is the reality. We, we just don't no, and I think the challenge with the, the challenge that I will say with the interpretation of the models is they're based on the scenario that was in place a couple of weeks ago, and I think that point that everything that we do now impacts those projections, right? I, I just don't, I don't think we can, but I think we. What's important is 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 the point that I tried to make about collecting real time data and monitoring that. I, I, I'm not going to make the prediction on that one. And do you think like statewide in the US even, is it possible for us to accurately measure incidents or cumulative incidents? Yeah. I already responded to this, but I want to see what your response is. But is it accurate? Is it able to act with the data that we have without doing? Yeah. I mean, I think, no, I think we can't. New diagnoses are not a, are not a surrogate for incidents. Again, I think there are some population-based studies being stood up. We're starting one here in Baltimore, and that's exactly the reason that we're doing it. Because the best way to monitor incidents is to follow a population of individuals and test them. I think the other way, you know, because the, the cohort study is very expensive, but doing serial cross-sections, right? Taking a sample of the population at one point in time, taking it another point in time, three months later, I think that's, a, that's another approach that's a little bit less costly than following a cohort. But no, I don't think we can infer directly. We've actually done serial cross-sections for the HIV epidemic Absolutely. in Baltimore since, nine, Tom will have to correct you, but 1980-something. Yeah. Um, and that has been really informative. Yeah. A couple of questions around other indicators to include in your Emily plan. So one question is about comorbidities. Are they important? Should they be collected? Another was um, that they noticed that you're not including disaggregation by race, yeah, wealth quantiles, or residential locations. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on these? Yeah, no, absolutely. Race, was an and sex? race was an oversight. I think also because of, I was thinking more kind of broadly for a particular country um, versus kind of, but absolutely. I mean, we've seen this in the United States. Race, ethnicity is critical. Socioeconomic status, geography. Um, where you have data. I was thinking about for a particular kind of health center approach, but yes, on a larger scale, you absolutely need those disaggregations. And what about comorbidities? So comorbidities, yeah, I put that as a, as a disaggregation for everything, right? Because I think that's critical. The question is which comorbidities um, and should those be indicators? I didn't think of those as indicators so much as a disaggregation. Yeah. Um, you know, and I can be a little bit more specific. I think, again, there are knowledge is evolving over time. So I think a, a broader collection is important, um, but, but not, to the, not to the extent that it overwhelms the ability to collect data. In a lot of, a lot of our um, listeners today work in um, community-based healthcare settings, and as, that's where your area of expertise is, is as well. So E.D. Ramit asked, in a large decentralized setting, 
local factors, healthcare work capacity at the local level could link, could impact the quality of care as well. What are yeah. some of the strategies I would say to overcome this? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that absolutely. So, I mean, I guess from a data perspective, um, qualitative doing data collection with the, again, I don't want to emphasize data collection too much because I know there's, there's so much involved with the response so that actually doing data collection doesn't help anyone, but, but sorry, not doesn't help anyone. Doesn't, we don't necessarily have the resources to do that, but I do think it's critical. You know, we have these implementation approaches. Again, I think we can build on our experience from HIV and other things, right? To improve how we deliver services, just doing quick assessments with the people actually delivering those services to understand what the needs are with rapid turnaround and, um, and, and implementation is, is potentially one of the ways forward. Um, two more challenging questions for you. Um, one, when working in low income countries or communities, what are some of the meaning, most meaningful indicators to track COVID response in healthcare facilities? And more importantly, the prevention measures against community transmission? Yeah, so I mean, again, testing is one, but PPE, the, the infection control practices, right? So I didn't put some of that in there in terms of what's being practiced within the health centers, you know, by the staff, what's being provided to them. Um, I, I think some of those uh, institutional indicate, you know, indicators of sort of institutional infrastructure and provision of protective equipment would be one thing. In terms of the community, I mean, some of it is basic education, right? In some of these low and middle income settings, right? People being aware of, of what they need to do and then the ability to practice those things at home, right? I think the challenge is people go from their healthcare setting to their home where it's just impossible to practice some of these um, behaviors, you know, but I think provision of, of simple things like soap and hand sanitizer, if it's possible, right, is, is something that can be done. But I think monitoring those um, policies and procedures that are put in place is just as important. Um, some of the challenges have been around the lack of ramp up of testing. So an interesting question is if we have data on symptom onset and the number of PUIs, um, would it be worth going back to calculate um, incidents or prevalence um, given that they've been testing backlogs to get a more accurate indicator of prevalence. Sorry, say that again. I didn't. I didn't quite follow. So in yeah. places where we didn't have testing early yeah. on, but we did have information on symptom onset. Is it worth yeah. going back and filling in the missing gaps? Filling in the missing gap, meaning testing those folks for antibodies and things like that, or going back. No, like using the symptom onset as a surrogate for uh, positive tests. <laughs> So hard. Yeah. I mean, I think you can. I, I do think, I, I, uh, I think there's so much challenging. There's, it's, it, I think it's worthwhile. You've got to do what you do, can do with the data that you have. I do think that one of the things that might help with that, if we get accurate um, antibody tests at some point is, is potential testing, right? Being able to link those people that were symptomatic and, and, and doing antibody testing to understand if there was truly an exposure. I mean, I think you can go through and map, and I think some people have done that. I think there are challenges with that, with the quality of that data. Um, a couple more, if you don't mind bearing with us. Sorry, you're getting inundated with questions. Um, Yoko Shamida, in terms of denominator regarding the number of testing, the country I'm living in right now is not reporting in the way that we have an accurate yeah. percentage of positive cases. Yeah. So the total number of tests done includes confirmatory tests of people being hospitalized, being discharged, and also populations that are tested repeatedly, such as airline pilots. Right. Are there models to help stratify this information? Yeah, so math, So the dynamic modeling, I think, can help with some of that, right? I think it's, again, you have to recognize that there are still limitations of those models, but I think that's what you have to rely on. You know, you have to assume um, some fold higher, actually, number of individuals tested. I think the other thing is, again, if you could supplement, I can't stress enough, if there is a way to supplement with some routine testing in some other setting to help understand those numbers, that would be ideal. But yes, models can help, but the models are only as good as the data you put into them. I'm going to do three more questions about, so, okay, so what measures of the COVID-19 burden do you think are important and or useful in terms of driving policy and health systems responses to this pandemic? 
I mean, it's the prevalence and incidence, right? Everyone, the golden number that everyone wants to know is the prevalence. It's the herd immunity, you know, the question of, of when will we be closer to herd immunity? I think in most places we are far from that, um, but the idea of what proportion of the population is, has been exposed, of course, caveats to that, we still don't understand exactly what um, what having antibodies means in terms of protection, but I think that one is the key. And then, um, you know, community transmission, ongoing community transmission, right? So incidents, I, I think those two key estimates. Sorry, was there a second part to that question? That was it. Okay. Um, another, so like, I think this is an area that a lot of us have also now started thinking about, you know, moving beyond just COVID-19. Um, Anush Patnik has a question, how do we monitor and track routine service delivery? and the impact that COVID-19 has had on routine service delivery, like maternal child health and immunization data. And yeah. have you seen dashboards using DHIS2 data in LMICs, or um, is there a strategy to task shift community healthcare workers or use telemedicine approaches to capture these missed opportunities? Yeah, absolutely. So hundred percent, I think that's critical. And I think that, um, I think that linking, I haven't seen dashboards that I've seen a couple of things that have focused on um, other mortality, you know, like mortality, it, you know, from other causes um, with all the caveats for that. I haven't seen people using routine data. A lot of the instruments that were developed that I shared the site for and the NIH is to ca have information kind of to try and capture from an individual level, what kind of healthcare appointments that have been missed, um, medications that have been, medication refills that have been missed. So that is one way, obviously that's cumbersome because you have to collect that. But I think integrating some data collection within routinely collected surveys, I know we're not doing those right now, would be ideal. I think telemedicine, I know in India where I work, that's where we're moving towards, right? Is that the government has released guidelines for telemedicine, you know, and, and our own programs are pivoting to do that, right? To deliver to deliver care through telemedicine and home delivery of medications, right? I think that's one of the other things that, that can work in LMICs compared to even a country like the U.S. is potentially delivering care and medications to the home. Um, which, you know, has its own challenges, but is a little bit safer than someone going into a health center. I have to sneak a question about from our previous dean, Mike Clagg. Oh, <laughs> just can't ignore that one. Um, what is the best evidence regarding the prevalence needed to impart herd immunity? Oh, uh, yeah, that, that. I it can't make it easy. <laughs> yeah, we don't know. That one, we'd, I mean, it's higher than any um, prevalence we have right now. There isn't. I mean, again, that, that evidence comes from modeling and from our, our experience with, with prior epidemics, pandemics, and that's well over 50, 60, 70 percent. Um, to feel comfortable. Um, so not easy. Um, there is a question that I want to quickly get your thoughts on about antibodies, um, like antibody testing and how that is, how if that's problematic when you're looking at m &E indicators. Because, yeah. you know, we're not, well, we're not getting to do the nasal PCRs. We are now seeing, especially in healthcare workforce, um, zero surveys that look at antibody testing. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, I mean, I think the antibody, the challenge with the antibody tests is there are so many of them and we still don't completely understand performance, right? We have to understand what which tests have been validated, the sensitivity, specificity, um, all of that. So I think there's the test performance issues, there's the issue of what antibodies mean, which we don't understand yet as well. But I think, I think it's still gonna be again, critical to monitoring, but we need to understand what it is that we're measuring. This has been phenomenal. So as we end the closing remarks, I wonder if it, we should address the first question that popped up, which was, I'm just curious to hear more about the how and why that was mentioned at the beginning. And if you had a closing remarks on the best practices or approaches to evaluate and learn progress, prospectively aligned with the monitoring aspects discussed. Yeah, <laughs> give me the tough questions. Yeah, I, I, you know, the how and the why, I mean, again, one of the biggest questions um, that we still haven't answered is why some people are getting sicker than others, right? Why some people are getting infected, why some people are asymptomatic and other people develop symptoms, why some people die and some people don't, why some entire families get sick. And I think those are the questions to me as an epidemiologist, those are the questions that I'm most curious about. And I think that's why I emphasized at the beginning, again, we need those outcome measures, the cases, the deaths and all that, but having all that other information 
the, the, the individual demographics, the comorbidities. I didn't even scratch the surface of the genetics, you know, all the things that are more difficult to, cap to, to capture. But I think those are the things we really need to give us the answers of how and why. Dr. Mehta, thank you so much for your time. I know that we haven't addressed all the questions here. So if you want to keep on popping questions off the Q&A screen, we will collate them and then email Dr. Mehta and see if we can get you some responses. Um, I think this was a really valuable session. And in, for the audience out there, if you have future suggestions for sessions, please just let us know. Um, we're going to be continuing this, we believe, for at least another couple of months. And we have some very interesting topics in the pipeline. Um, so please keep your eyes posted to our main page um, where we have strategies for COVID-19 response. You'll also see that for all of our talks to date, there is the PowerPoint presentation, a recording of the presentation, and a compiled resource page that you can access. Um, and we will aim to post this hopefully later on today. Um, thank you everybody for joining, and especially Dr. Mehta for joining as well. Thank you.